Good evening, everybody. I'm Naomi Takuyan Underwood, Executive Director of the Asian American Journalists Association. AAPI Heritage Month has come to a close, but we know that the work we have in grappling with the challenges of our community should continue. There's an opportunity for us to come together to acknowledge and learn from our shared histories and the role that journalists of color and all of journalism can play. We're so proud and thankful to partner with NABJ tonight. And now I want to introduce AAJA President Michelle Yehi Lee, whose leadership has guided AAJA through a difficult year and a half that none of us could have ever imagined. But before that, I'm proud to introduce my dear friend, colleague, and stalwart ED of NABJ, who has been such a source of support and advice, Drew Berry. We're looking forward to making good trouble together. Drew? <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, uh, before we get to NABJ President Dorothy Tucker and, and Pres Michelle Yehi Lee, um, I just want to say I'm looking forward to this program because in our prep sessions, I continue to learn just so much, so, so, so much about enormous opportunities that journalists and uh, have to better understand, to, to get context and report on so many things that happen in, that are happening in our communities and cultures in which I'm not as familiar. Uh, as many of you know, NA, NABJ, AAJA, NAHJ with other journalism organizations uh, continue to partner on some select opportunities uh, in the absence of uh, what we used to call unity. Uh, but we have a very, 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 very healthy and respectful relationship as uh, this and other opportunities are created to push for progress in areas where our common missions intersect. So Michelle and Dorothy, you can take it from here. Michelle. Thanks, Drew. And thank you all for joining this important discussion today. Uh, we're really excited to have this conversation and really looking forward to it. A few months ago, when AJ was responding to the Atlanta shootings, I received a Twitter DM from Dorothy Tucker, who reached out to support because she knew as a fellow president of a minority journalist organization, the unique pains that AJ's journalists were experiencing during that time. So on a Saturday morning, Dorothy and I got on the phone and we talked for a long time about our respective journalists and our shared pains and the opportunities to work together on a deeper level for all minority journalists. Since George Floyd's murder, I've witnessed a shift among AAJ members. I've heard repeatedly from our members that we want to confront our API community's history of anti-Blackness and show up for our Black colleagues in ways we haven't before. But our members also found it difficult to talk about these topics and cover them, and they feared getting it wrong. So Dorothy and I talked about these dynamics and we decided, let's face it head on. Let's have a webinar and help our journalists to recognize the power that they have in dividing or uniting Black and Asian communities. And that's what brings us here today. I wanna to thank Dorothy for her friendship and for her leadership and for her kind Twitter DM that led us to this moment. She's truly a dedicated and inspirational leader. And I know that we will continue to work together for our organizations and for all communities of color. So Dorothy, over to you. Mute. All right. Thank you, Michelle, for those kind words. The admiration is mutual. What happened between Michelle and I was an instant connection that has led to today's collaboration. As Michelle said, our goal is to educate Black and Asian journalists. We hope to offer a better understanding of the culture, the history, and the nuances of our respective communities so that we, as journalists, can provide better coverage. In the last few months, uh, we've seen an increasing number of reports highlighting Black Asian tensions. We'll discuss here why there is a history of conflict and how we as journalists must be careful not to perpetuate the negative stereotypes that fuel racial tensions. As an example of the kind of reporting that adds to the tensions are the stories that include the viral videos uh, that we've all seen where the black assailants are harming Asian victims. I understand that the videos are indeed needed to highlight anti-Asian violence and anti-Asian hate, but the vast majority, or rather Asian hate and Asian violence, 
But the vast majority of the criminals in the videos are Black. So the assumption from the public is that most of the acts of hate are committed by Black assailants, and that is not true. What's needed to be included in those stories are the stats, like you'll find in research from the University of Michigan, and I'm quoting here. When the media identified the race of the offender, the majority of the perpetrators of anti-Asian harassment were reported to be male and white. While we recognize the enduring legacy of the enslavement of Black people in today's webinar, we will also talk about the similarities of our communities. Both groups have suffered acts of racism, discrimination, and violence. Those shared experiences have prompted acts of solidarity around the country between Black and Asian communities. We encourage more acts of solidarity, and that is one of the reasons that we are here today. Michelle will now introduce our panelists. Well, I'm very excited to do so. Our very esteemed uh, lineup features, and I will introduce each of them now. First, we have Sherilyn Eiffel, President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. We have John C. Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Asian American Justice Center, also known as AAAJ, AAJC. And Paula Madison, award-winning journalist, former NBC executive and current chairman and CEO of the media consultancy company, Madison Media Management, LLC. We're really excited to hear that Paula's book, Finding Samuel Lowe, China, Jamaica, Harlem, is being developed as a documentary, documentary series. And we are looking forward to hearing more about that later in the session. Thank you. Um, we will now want to remind our, our guests here that we will be taking questions. So we want to make sure that you um, go to the chat and, and uh, I'm sorry, I am just trying to make sure. Okay, we wanna make sure that you go to the chat and you put, your, you put your questions in, but we are going to start off with our questions to the panelists. And our first question is for both Cheryl Lynn uh, and John. In both of your respective roles, how do you view the relationship between Asians and Blacks? And Cheryl Lynn, I'll let you answer first. Thank you very much, Dorothy. And I wanna say hello to everyone on this panel, um, to John and to Paula, hey Paula, and to Michelle, uh, and to tell you how uh, pleased and honored I am to participate in this conversation. And I'm so glad that you're doing it. Um, Michelle, John, and I had a Washington Post Live conversation a month or so ago, and I thought that was important as well, uh, because uh, in this very, very difficult, challenging moment in our country, we need to get this right. We need to actually understand what is our relationship, what is the relationship between and among marginalized groups, and we need to understand the centrality of white supremacy and the challenges that our groups face and we need to understand that um, the tensions that can arise from the perpetuation of white supremacy, that none of us, none of our, the groups to which we belong are immune. That is what white supremacy does. It uh, organizes itself around creating others and it organizes itself around um, developing a system in which people fight to get to the, the, the center of what is essentially held by white supremacy, which is power and privilege. And we see that in the history. Uh, we see that in you know, many of the cases that have really addressed this issue of challenging white supremacy, well articulate the way in which that tension can play out. Um, I think a lot about uh, Martha Lum, the nine-year-old schoolgirl whose father in 1927 challenged uh, the requirement that she attend the colored school in Bolivar County, Mississippi. Um, this is a Chinese American family. Uh, he wants his daughter to be able to attend the white school. And we can imagine why he might want that given what the conditions were in many black schools in the South uh, when uh, during this period in 1927. And 
uh, he is ultimately unsuccessful. He brings his case in the Mississippi courts. He loses in the Mississippi Supreme Court. He takes it to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court says that the state has the right to, uh, to decide uh, who can go to what school by race. And because there is a black school, which they don't call a black school, they call a segregated school. So there's schools and there's segregated schools. That's how, that's the language the Supreme Court uses. So they don't say white schools and black schools, schools and segregated schools. And since there is a segregated school, meaning black school, uh, available um, in proximity for Martha Lum to the court says conveniently attend, uh, her rights are not being undermined by the state uh, assigning her to the colored school. That case, that 1927 case is overturned, is not overturned until Brown versus Board of Education, right? And that connection, understanding that through line between the fight of this uh, family in, in Bolivar County, Mississippi to challenge segregation on behalf of their daughter and the through line to Brown is vitally important because what's happening in both cases, in both cases, the, the structure, the infrastructure of white supremacy is assigning to children of color, to Asian uh, children and to black children, the place where they can be. And why are they doing this? Are they doing this just because it's nice to be with your own people and we just wanna be with our own people and separate but equal is fine? No, that's of course what Brown finally confronts and reveals that the whole point of segregation is to subordinate non-white people is to send a message of subordination. It's also to ensure that the white community holds for itself uh, the things that are of greatest value. No Southern jurisdiction is actually able to maintain a separate and equal school system. They know that. One is going to be inferior in terms of funding and resources. They simply don't have the resources to do it. So when they perpetuate the system, they are necessarily creating a system where one school system has the laboratory equipment, the new textbooks, the, the uh, beautiful building, the plumbing and so forth, and another school system, which receives a fraction of the funding and whose teachers are paid a fraction, uh, have the inferior buildings, the hand-me-down books, and so on and so forth. And so how we as two communities deal with what white supremacy is trying to do is actually always the challenge before us. Are we gonna stand side by side with one another against white supremacy, recognizing what this manipulation is about? Or are we gonna scrabble for the scraps that white supremacy often throws to one group or another at a given moment in order to destabilize what could be the unity between people of color? I will just say finally that I am involved in one of the most powerful representations that I think LDF is, is um, privileged to be a part of, and that's representing a diverse coalition of students in the Harvard Affirmative Action case. Here's a case in which uh, Ed Blum, um, a, a conservative white business person who has been um, funding basically litigation that, that tries to uh, infuse and, and continue so much of this white supremacist history, whether it's funding uh, challenges to uh, Section five of the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby case, or uh, the Fisher affirmative action case, uh, now the Harvard affirmative action case, uh, the North Carolina affirmative action case. This is all one white man who is basically creating this infrastructure. He tried first with white students in the Fisher case. It was kind of hard to keep finding white students who would try to unsuccessfully challenge affirmative action. And then he put himself behind an organization that is ostensibly, ostensibly of white uh, students and parents who are trying to challenge affirmative action at Harvard and various other places. And the, now the argument is that affirmative action is actually harming Asian, uh, is discrimination against Asian students, uh, Asian American students, uh, rather than white students in the hope that this will be a more saleable argument. Why I'm pro so proud to participate in the case is because of the diverse coalition of students we represent and to see the power of the Asian American community, including John Yang, and Asian Americans advancing justice have been so powerful and unequivocal in their recognition of the way in which this suit is focused on divide and conquer. And they have refused to allow it to drive a wedge between uh, our communities. And so we have been a shoulder to shoulder in this representation uh, and in challenging this effort. Uh, this is the kind of thing we have to do. This is the kind of thing we have uh, done often in the past. And this is a really important moment for us to to recognize that uh, our power is in our unity, that um, to look you know, white supremacy straight in the eye and recognize its goal 
and its tactics and to not succumb to either of them. Thank you, Sherilyn. John? Sure, uh, let me start by just thanking all of you for organizing this. It is always such a pleasure to appear on these with Sherilyn who is so thoughtful in how she talks about these. And it's just wonderful to engage in these conversations. Maybe let me start from where Sherilyn left off and talking about affirmative action and then broaden the discussion a little bit. Because Sherilyn's absolutely right. It's, this is one specific example of how people try to use our communities against each other. And literally Ed Blum, after the Fisher case, he was at a podium that basically said, I need to find an Asian plaintiff because he recognized that his tactic of using white students was not working. He recognized that if he could find a way to divide our communities of color, he might have better success to put that in sort of a, a different cloth, if you will. But we all know what that cloth is. And let's be clear about affirmative action is Asian Americans actually support affirmative action. And this is one of the narratives that we need to make clear in survey opinions at polls that we have done, we have consistently shown that Asian Americans support affirmative action, typically around 70% in favor, only about 20% 20, 20 against. Uh, the statistics have varied over time, but if anything, our support of affirmative action has increased over time. And, and that's important because there are gonna be those that look at those loud narratives coming from certain Asian American communities. And I recognize there are Asian American communities that don't support affirmative action, but they are in the minority, right? But we can't let those voices be the voices for the Asian American community on this. Now, why is this important? This is also important if we broaden that narrative into one of what I think is the most pernicious stereotypes about the Asian American community. And this is the stereotype of a model minority. And this stereotype, again, is used to divide our communities. And why do I think it's pernicious? I think it's pernicious for three reasons. One, it's false. Two, it is what I would call self-limiting. And three is it's divisive. First, it's false. You know, th this narrative, I think all of you probably recognize what it is, is this notion that Asian Americans are a model minority, that the, we are the good people of color. If you sort of look at statistics, that people think that we demonstrate above the median when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to economics, when it comes to education. But it's just false. Because if you look at the statistics, if you start to break it down, Yes, there are Asian Americans that are doing well, but there's a large swath of our community that are not doing well. In fact, Asian Americans have the largest wealth gap of any racial ethnic community in the country. If you look at our poverty rates in New York City, we have the highest poverty rate of any community in New York City. So if you start to break down those statistics, you recognize that Asian Americans are not necessarily doing well. If anything, by portraying it that way, you're rendering invisible that portion of our community that has such significant needs. Second is this notion is what I would call self-limiting. You know, it's clothed in this idea that, that sort of they're trying to complement the Asian American community. Like, you guys are doing well. But by doing that, they are basically telling our community, you have nothing to complain about. Just keep your head down, do what you're doing. You'll fall into that stereotype of being hard workers, you know, good at math and science, and, and you're going to be fine, right? But once you unpack those stereotypes, you recognize that the flip side of those stereotypes is, well, you're not really good leaders. You're not very articulate. You're not quite sort of socially as adept as the rest of America. And therefore, you know, you don't belong in the C-suites. You don't belong in, on, on the board, boards of directors. You're not equity partners. You're not in a high government positions. So that's why that stereotype breaks down there too. Third, and probably the worst thing is that it's divisive. You know, it's this notion that we're the good community of color and that somehow other communities of color are not making it because of something to do with their own fault or that they are to, to blame, right? It is this notion that, well, how can America be racist if there's a community of color that is doing well? And the reality is it's that's not true. And by portraying it that way, it's basically giving a pass to this notion of white supremacy that Sherilyn is talking about. This notion that no, we're not a white supremacist country because there's a community of color that's doing well. So we have to be careful about all of that. And the last thing I would just say about alliances is, Michelle, I really appreciated how you started this conversation and how Dorothy reached out to you. I had the same thing happen with Sherilyn. I just after the Atlanta killings, Sherilyn texted me and I get emotional talking about this every time because it meant that much to me. She texted me and said, hey, what can I do? And then we got on a call together, a Zoom together, and it was just beautiful. It was tragically beautiful, but it was beautiful. 
right? We, we got together with a group of our, our friends and colleagues from ADL, from the Human Rights Campaign, from Unidos US and Naleo. And, and Cheryl and Turby tell the story, but it's when I got on that Zoom call, I honestly saw in everyone's faces, I saw the Charleston Church, I saw the Tree of Life Synagogue, I saw Pulse Nightclub, I saw El Paso. And there was this such shared pain, and now we had to add Atlanta to that long list. But I also saw in all of that the shared power that all of us have in fighting that racism together and sort of how we could use those shared experiences to lift each other up and sort of be able to talk about this in a different way. And certainly for me during this time, I'm sure it's been a godsend. You know, I've, we've had many calls together just learning from her experiences with Black Lives Matter and last summer, how she navigated all of that, because that's a lot of what our community has been facing this year. And just trying to understand sort of how sort of she, she was thinking about these issues has just been really, really beautiful. So that's also a place where sort of through all of this, we even further solidify these alliances about how we show up for each other. Thanks for sharing that, John. Um, it makes me a little emotional sharing the conversation that Dorothy and I had too, because these are very unique, but such shared um, pains. And the conversation she and I had was basically, you know, I know what you're going through. I'm here for you. And I told her, I was like, Dorothy, I should have been there for you more last year. I'm here for you. And um, I'm really glad for those conversations. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think at the... Um... You know, at the time we didn't know we would be here, but I think we automatically knew that we were going to do something together. Um, you know, and we knew that we were going to open a door where, you know, it, it, we may bring up some things that will make people uncomfortable, but uncomfortable is good, you know, because we, we do need to talk about these things. So uh, I'm, I'm glad we're here. Yeah. Well, um, Sherilyn and John, you guys just gave a really great overview to, to start off with. And so let's get into some of those uncomfortable points. Let's talk about the media coverage. We have, you know, a, a 150 people on here, mostly journalists. Let's talk about the role of journalism and, and our coverage. Um, tell us more about those narratives that you've been seeing inaccurately told about our communities and the role that you've seen media play in perpetuating or refuting those narratives. Uh, Sherilyn, you wanna start and then John? Uh, unmute. You know, somebody always has to be on mute, I'm sorry. Um, no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, this is really important um, and uh, we have to really begin to get our hands around it. The, the story that John, John was just telling about that night when we when we got on the Zoom, is it is a snapshot of America that we shouldn't run up past too quickly. So on the call is the leader of you know the leading Jewish civil rights organization, the leading African American civil rights organization, Latino, gay, Asian American, and we're all on this Zoom, and we are all advising John out of our own experience just in the last six years with mass killings within our own community perpetuated by people outside our community. I mean, I, I just really wanna just pause on that for a minute because that actually, I haven't seen that story written. <laughs> I haven't seen that story written that that, it, that can happen on an American day that these leaders can come together late at night for us to say, well, this is, what's gonna, this is what you're gonna face, you know, get ready for this. What are you, how are you talking to your staff? How, why, why is that a well of experience that we should have as leaders? Why are we just going past that? So I wanted to just kind of start with like the narratives that are untold about stories that sit in the center of American life for many of us, but that somehow are just regarded as what happens, not as a moment of pause that gives us a snapshot of this country. The second piece is that, um, you know, I won't talk about the, the issues of violence that are happening right now, just because I think at the top of the hour, I think it was Dorothy really did a great job of kind of summarizing how some of that is skewed. But I want to talk about what's underneath that. And what's underneath that is this ongoing conversation about citizenship. Citizenship. And citizenship is a conversation in this country about who belongs and who doesn't belong. And it's important for us to be honest about this fact. For black people, 
the, 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 who were formerly enslaved in this country. The Dred Scott decision in 1850, the Supreme Court said that black people could not be citizens of this country, not just enslaved black people, free or enslaved black, black people could not be citizens of this country. That's, there are many other things that that decision said, which we know, but that's one of the most powerful and important things that it said. It's so powerful and important that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, remember there are three, three amendments after the Civil War, 13th ending slavery, 14th Amendment, and 15th Amendment. 15th Amendment protects the right to vote for Black people. The 14th Amendment, the opening line is about citizenship. Any person born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States and the state right, in which they live. They are citizens. And the purpose of that first line is to rebuke the Dred Scott decision, to ensure that Black people would not be what the Dred Scott, Scott decision made them, stateless people. So it confers citizenship in a way that's powerful and important. And I just wanna say that, that that articulation of citizenship that black people have been able to hold on to since 1868 has been super important. It's shown up in immigration and naturalization laws. It, there, there has been an aspect of that that has been precious to us that we are citizens, that black people who are descended from slaves are citizens. And sometimes that can be deployed, particularly in debates around immigration in ways that if journalists are not doing the careful work, people get confused about what the history actually is. People forget and don't know about the procession of immigration laws that prevented Asian people from being able to be citizens in this country. The citizenship conversation becomes something of recent vintage, not as though this country did not, with absolute deliberation, create laws that kept people who were working incredibly hard, building American industry, building the West, uh, in, engaged in creating thriving communities, prevented them by law, by statute, by congressional statute, from becoming citizens of this country. And so some of the tension that we see around, and, and of course those, those laws no longer exist, but the legacy of them exists about who belongs and who doesn't belong, which is what the citizenship question is all about. And sometimes I think we see that continuing to play out in the way we talk about the Asian American population, in the way in which some Black people respond to the Asian American population, um, in the way in which, once again, white supremacy allows us to uh, have some people be closer to the concept of citizenship and some people farther away from the concept of citizenship and what it means for some people to feel comfort in the proximity to citizenship and to feel superior to those, at least in terms of the rightfulness and the belonging to those who are far, farther away. And then at the same time, from the other side, you have those who um, you know, give in to the model minority myth that John was talking about. And every time a news story doesn't unpack what that myth is made of, but just talks about it, it reinforces the salience of that myth. Uh, and so I think part of the problem for journalists is that journalists need to become acquainted with the history. You need to become acquainted with the history of Black people being made stateless persons by Dred Scott, the importance of the 14th Amendment to Black citizenship, the way in which successive immigration laws excluded uh, Asian people from becoming citizens of this country until frankly very recently, and what that meant for how the Asian American community had to organize itself and was compelled to live in relationship to power and white supremacy. If you don't understand those two strains, then it's very hard for you to be reporting with accuracy about what is playing out on a street, a given street in Queens. Because those interactions are filled and backfilled and undergirded with the history of how we all have been manipulated in our second and third class status in this country until this you know, Congress at some point was willing to confer citizenship status on us. And the way in which we become jealous of, as I say, the, the crumbs of second-class citizenship and how that compels us to behave towards one, one another. So mostly what I see are, are um, stories that in, with, sometimes without even meaning to perpetuate the stereotypes by simply repeating them without providing the context and without helping educate the public about how we got here and who we are. 
in relationship, again, to the core of white supremacy that has defined who belongs and who doesn't belong. Thank you, Sherilyn. I want to point out that, you know, while Michelle and I wanted to uh, target this and, and talk to and, and uh, target Black and, and Asian journalists, it is clear to us that this is a lesson for all journalists. And I'm hoping that all of in our audience are, are listening to uh, what's being said here and judging from the chat, I hear a lot of folks saying, pre-John. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Uh, John, you want to? Uh... Sure, and I appreciate Sherilyn talking about this history, right? Because it's sort of how this history has manifested itself for the Asian American community is, you know, racism has this notion of what we would call a perpetual foreigner, this notion that we did not have this right to become a citizen until, as she said, very recently. Now, what is also important about that history, though, is that when we're talking about how recent we had the right to become citizens, citizens, it really tracks to what was called the Immigration and Nationality, uh, Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. Why do I always say 1965? It is not lost on our community that this was also part of the civil rights movement. You know, this notion that sort of for us to have the rights that we are, have, again, is built on the legacy of people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and so many others during that civil rights movement of the 1960s. And this also points to something that we in the Asian American community have to learn and have to understand is that we're building on the legacies that we are so we're, we're privileged because we, we come on the legacies. And literally when I say we come is when we immigrated here to the United States, recognizing that about two thirds of the Asian population are immigrants, in other words, born in a foreign country. When we immigrated here, we are, a lot of the hardest work was already done by the African-American community in getting the Voting Rights Act passed, getting sort of uh, the housing laws passed, getting the equal opportunity laws passed. So we, in that sense, had, if you will, a leg up. And we in the Asian-American community need to recognize that as well, is that we did not have some of the same fights that the African-American community have. We, in that sense, we, we had a certain privilege and, and that we, should, we need to recognize that. So when the Asian American community talks about sort of sort of falling into that model minority stereotype, I think that's something that we have to recognize within ourselves. It, just to put a pin on the point that Dorothy made, though, I, I do want to come back to this notion of sort of uh, the supposed uh, you know, black on Asian violence that that people sometimes talk about. We just I, I'm going to emphasize this: we cannot fall prey to that. Right. And the statistics are there, whether it's this University of Michigan study, there's an NIH study that came out at the beginning of the year that showed the same thing. The vast majority of the attacks on Asian Americans are by white people, not only that, by white males. If we want to emphasize that even further, who was the person that killed six Asian American women, as well as two others in Atlanta? Who was the person that killed four Sikh Americans in Indianapolis? It was a white male. And we need to call that out for what that is. And there, there's I know that there has been some reporting that has been done on that, but that shouldn't be the second report, so to speak. It shouldn't be first focused on sort of this, this, these videos of, of African-Americans attacking Asian Americans and then getting to the story of, well, if we put this into context, the first story should be about, all right, well, who is it that is really attacking us? And the last thing I would say about this is to all of us, I don't think it's lost on us that at the same time we've seen these killings, We've seen George Floyd, we've seen Armand Aubrey, we've seen Dante Wright, we've seen the insurrection at the Capitol. We, we need to make sure that these narratives, these stories that we are telling, fit that larger framework of what we are all experiencing. This is just, to, to, this is not a story, this is a lived experience. And making sure that that lived experience is reported consistently and not just seeing these as snapshots. Because I think that's important to understand what is happening in America and what we have to confront together. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I think this is a great spot to bring in Paula Madison, who we introduced earlier. But for those of you who don't know, Paula is of Asian and African-American descent. She's documented her family's unique history in a film, Finding Samuel Lowe. That's Paula's Chinese grandfather. Let's take a quick look at the trailer.
my husband said, when you find these Chinese people in your family, what are you expecting to happen? You know you're black? <laughs> I know I'm black. I expect that because I'm their family and they're my family, we'll be family. The venture that we're taking to China, it's like a dream come true to finally find some people who are related to me. I knew that I am a low and they will want me as much as I want them. Wow. Um, yeah, you eat just that little 35 seconds, Paula. <laughs> it says, it says so much. And it is, um, I, I, I know it's powerful. I did get a chance to watch a little bit more than that. And I can tell everybody they definitely should, uh, you know, definitely should watch it. So my first question to you, Paula, is from, from your perspective, what are some of the major issues that you see that cause the kind of conflict that we've seen in the past or historically between Black and Asian communities? And, you know, what can, what do journalists need to know? And, uh, you know, what can we learn? Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm quite overjoyed by having listened to uh, my fellow Vassar alum, Sherilyn, and John, who I'm, I'm so grateful to you for, for providing to us those studies that indicate um, the myth that uh, significant numbers of these attacks against our Asian, um, large, mostly elders and women, are being committed by African Americans. Um, in fact, it's a very small percentage. Um, you know, I, I should say here that I too uh, was a working journalist. And when I left journalism, I left journalism as the vice president and news director of NBC4 in New York. So I spent a, a significant number of years in, in print journalism, newspaper journalism before I crossed over to television. Um, and I am a Chinese Jamaican descent. One of the things that was said earlier, and I think Michelle, you said it, that I that, you know, kind of have a unique background and, and I wanna dispel that. There are probably hundreds of thousands of black Asians um, alive today. Uh, we are all over the world. And many of us um, don't fit the image of many of our parents are comprised of a soldier who went to, um, you know, East Asia and found someone, a woman who he fell in love with. And that's how you have black and Asian people, which today the, the vernacular, we call ourselves Blasians for black Asians. There are lots and lots of us, right? Some of them we've been writing about lately, Naomi Osaka and so forth. I'll leave it to you to figure out who all these black Asians are. But what I will say is that I think one of the things that we as journalists um, have to confront and pay very close attention to is the conversation that we're having right here is not the conversation that's going on among our parents and our grandparents, right? Um, in our parents and our grandparents' times, particularly for those of us who are of the Asian diaspora, frequently they come from Asia with a built-in discrimination towards people from the African diaspora not because they've experienced any kind of relationship with them, but because of the racism that has been um, spread around the world by the United States, by England, by France, by Italy, by Germany. Pick a Western European nation or pick a nation that has in fact enslaved Africans. And most often those are the nations where you will find that um, 
people of the African diaspora are largely depicted as subhuman, are largely depicted as people who wished to remain enslaved, so lazy and happy to be enslaved that they stayed on long after, oh, three years, that date Juneteenth, which will be celebrated soon. And I hope all of our Asian uh, and Asian Pacific um, brothers and sisters here learn what Juneteenth really was. It was a bait and switch. It was lying to black people. It was keeping them enslaved and, and working. Although the Emancipation Proclamation had been declared three years before, but nobody had cell phones. There was no technology. So what I want to be really, really clear about here is that the conversation that's going on in our parents' households, and I dare say I would be your grandparents for a lot of you, I'm 69. This is where I was saying the other day, I fit the black don't crack, Asian don't raisin. And then I heard a new one, which was rice is nice. Uh, uh, rice is nice. And I was like, oh, I like that one too. So what I wanna say here is that um, we have, a built-in fear of Black people that we see almost immediately upon the arrival in the United States. And yet, when we go back to the days of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, what we see is when Chinese people were just cut loose, most of them from Zhongshan and Toisan in Guangdong province, just cut loose and left after the railroad was built, they ended up in places, square states like Utah and South Dakota and North Dakota, right? Square meaning they're either rectangles or squares. Let's just draw a line and make a boundary. But then when you get to Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia, places that are seen as the traditional South, there were significant numbers of Chinese there too. So for the people who are present, if your parents and grandparents have been in this country two, three, four, even five generations, because that does exist, and they were in the South and might still be in the South, there were the Chinese grocers who operated in the Black communities. Why? Because they couldn't operate in the white communities, and they damn sure couldn't live in the white communities. So we have a history of these people actually being together and cooperating. What I wanna make clear here is that one of the things that we have not talked about is the culture, right? We, we, we've talked about the laws and we've talked about the discrimination and we've talked about how we're coming together and all of those are absolutely um, to be emphasized. But what I also want to emphasize here is the misunderstandings that are going on, not only in the communities of the AAPI people and the African descended people, but among journalists who are in AAJA and NABJ, right? Because the culture that largely is in the East is going to be one that, that hews to Confucianism, right? And Confucius teaches that you don't make a spectacle of yourself. You're not loud. You don't come on strong, which actually is very different from the way a lot of African-Americans and black people are acculturated. We dance, we sing, we're loud. We're, we, 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 whenever we can, if there is an injustice, very frequently you'll see us speaking out. So what happens? I know my African-American brethren and sistren have an underlying resentment as to, well, why suddenly hashtag stop Asian hate? Why, why are we black people supposed to rally around that when we've been seeing for decades the murder, the lynching, the unfair fill in the blank towards black people, but we didn't see the AAPI community stand up. And I will try to offer an explanation here. It is not an excuse. I will try to offer an explanation. 
The explanation being that, one, you didn't come to this country as people of the Asian diaspora to make a spectacle. You came here to rise. You came here to make money. You came here to have to develop an economic independence. And so you don't get involved in certain kinds of things. And for black people, when all these things are going on and we're not seeing a coalition, a bonding of people of color, you have some black people standing with their arms crossed why are we expected to stand up for them when they're not standing up for us? Well, thank God this past summer, what we saw after the murder, the brutal lynching of George Floyd, we saw largely in millennials, Gen Z came together, linked arms and said, that's it, no more, we've had enough. So I was inspired by seeing all of that happened, but I didn't see my own generation, right, come out of our silos and appear together to say, this is an issue of racism. And as Sherilyn explained, it has to do with who gets to be a citizen and who gets to have power and who gets to have none. So what I wanna explain here, and then I will sit quietly for a moment so that there are more questions. What I want to explain here is that it's a culture of not getting involved. I think that if you're in your 40s, 50s, 30s even, you might recollect that when stuff is going on that involves demonstrations and protests, you don't ordinarily see a large number of Asian American people participating not because they don't care, but because that's not a part of the culture, right? So if we can begin to understand and come together and have conversations around this, what we might be able to do is form the kinds of relationships, coalitions, cadres even, where we work together, whether in a circumstance where we're going to legislatively challenge, whether we're going to, um, take to the streets, whether there will be letter writing, social media challenges. There's a variety of ways to do this, which I think can accommodate almost everyone's style. But we first have to understand that because people are not necessarily doing exactly what you're doing, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't care. But the issue of, um, I will speak to China. The issue of, in China, there being uh, a perceived bias against people of African descent. Understand that in China, the bias is against anyone who's not Chinese. That's where the bias begins. If you're not Chinese, you're second or third class. By what happened in the West, the Chinese then interpreted as then the black people, based on what they're seeing in these nations um, that were dominated by Western Europeans, black people are pushed to the bottom. So the Chinese adopted that perspective that black people are lower than white people. So go to China, go to any major upscale mall and you will see ads with white skin, blonde hair, blue eyes. You would think that you're on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. You'll see that and you'll see next to that Chinese models, not trying to have blonde hair, Chinese models, just beginning to see black models, just beginning because the attitude towards beauty and what is elevated in the West is just now being understood in the East, right? So there are cultural differences that I think not only do we have to talk about, but before we talk about them, I think 
we have to educate ourselves as to the existence of them and then go into a safe space and have the conversation. Thanks for that, Paula. I, you have touched on so many topics and so many important points. Um, and we would love to come back to that uh, later on in the conversation. Um, for now, we want to open up to Q&A. Um, we're also mindful of everyone's time um, and know that some folks have to hop on a little earlier. Um, why don't we start with uh, Sherilyn? Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different topics here, but can you tell us about some obvious missed opportunities that journalists should be paying more attention to? Bring us some of your expertise um, and some takeaways that both Black journalists should uh, Black journalists should know when covering Asian communities, that Asian journalists should know when covering uh, the Black communities. What are the major thoughts and themes that you want to impart to us as we cover our communities? Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, first of all, I would just say diversity within our communities uh, is something that for the for the mainstream media is frankly not interested in. You know, they're just they're just not a lot of, I mean, even the example that Paula was just giving about people not getting involved in activism. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I see that as as purely an uh, an Asian American thing as much as an immigrant thing. You'll find this in the Caribbean community and the African immigrant community as well, right? Where parents will say, put your head down, exactly what you said, Paula. We brought, we came here for these reasons, right? Not for you to do all this other stuff, right? But what I find is that there's not a lot of um, nuance about, you know, black immigrants versus, you know, from different regions, from, from Africa versus the Caribbean. Um, there's not a lot of, of nuance. That's why the model minority myth and all of the work we do around affirmative action that kind of you know, talks about Asian Americans uh, in, in ways that deny that poverty exists, that, you know, that, that segregation exists, that people are in uh, dire economic circumstances in the Asian American community. There's just an unwillingness to go beyond or below the kind of top line narrative about both of our communities. And again, this is where I just think the reality is that journalists are insufficiently uh, educated themselves. I mean, you, you, you know, you hear Paula laying out all this stuff. It's like, you know, you got to really go in to really understand the communities that you're writing about. And the presumptions that people are taking are just unreal. I guess the second piece is what's happening right now, which is that, is the Asian American moment closing? I mean, so we had a terrible massacre. There was a lot of attention. There were a lot of media stories. And now what, right? What happens after the terrible event? Is there a commitment to maintaining a level of engagement around understanding how events like what happened in Atlanta can happen? That's always the question I'm asking. After, after uh, Charleston, you'll remember that at the you know, bail hearing for the young man, I think maybe two of the, of the uh, two family members of the people who were killed in the, in the manual, uh, excuse me, AME church, talked about forgiveness and that became the story. Most of the families actually didn't, but that became the story. And now we didn't have to keep paying attention to the black community in Charleston, to what, to, to what, you know, if you've ever been to the Emanuel church, to why you have this big, you know, tr traditionally black church right in the prime of downtown, but surrounded by all these shopping areas and not at all in a black community, which obviously at some point it must've been in a black community. What happened in downtown Charleston? that uh, means that black people no longer live there. Like there's no curiosity about the context that surrounds these events. It's just a mass shooting happened, two weeks of you know, tremendous and intense interest. And then there's the pullback again, when in fact, these terrible events are actually apertures through which we can go to understand each other better. That's what I try to do. That's why I make the call because, because the aperture is open and I want, to come in deeper. I want to take advantage of that opportunity for us to walk more closely together. Yes, I wanna lift up my brother. Yes, I wanna be comforting. Yes, I want all of that. But I also know that these moments happen that open the door 
and that given the way in which we are siloed in our country, we must take advantage of those moments for that sustained engagement. And so John knows I was on social media encouraging people. I did the Hollaback bystander training. I was doing all this stuff and I was in, trying to encourage my followers to do the same, to basically say, I want you to make an investment in this moment not just to read about it and tisk tisk and say, isn't it terrible? But to say, you know what? I'm gonna get training. I'm gonna learn more about this organization. I'm gonna come out to this event. I reached out to clergy members here in, in New York saying, black clergy, I need you to speak. I need you to speak. Yes, I know that, that these videos are driving the sense that these attacks are disproportionately being done by black people. But to the extent that one of them is being done by black people, let's hear your voice because that's gonna be important. So I just think for journalists, sustaining the, the interest in, in understanding our communities, that's really up to you. When the stories go away, the interest goes away. And so you've got to figure out how to find a hook that maintains engagement with um, the context of, of the communities that you're writing about when these events happen. These are real communities with rich histories and with rich realities and real challenges. And they're deserving of the kind of attention that incessantly followed Trump voters to every diner in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, you know, it was it was worthwhile to sit down with five diners, you know, every week to find out what what would, what did Trump voters want? Where is that level of attention to I, our? I, I think we have to drive that, Sherilyn, is what I hear you saying, and I, I completely agree. Yes, uh, because our news managers are constantly asking for original stories, original pitches. Well, that's an easy one. That's a no-brainer. Right. And that also keeps the, keeps the information out there. And those are the kind of stories that we should keep doing because to your point, otherwise, you know, we're, we're all going to forget it and we definitely don't want that to happen. Uh, we're seeing some questions here where people are asking, is this recording going to be available? Absolutely it is because we want you to play it and play it and listen again. Uh, I do have a, I want to go to questions. Go to but I, I just want to. Paula's I got wanna, something to say. So Paula, please jump thank in. Thank you. I, I, I want to um, address something that Sherilyn said, and that is absolutely. It is a larger immigrant story, right? But I will tell you as a child of Jamaican parents um, and the Caribbean, Caribbean people, West Indians do not come to the United States, get attacked and hide. That is not, that is not what happens. If you attack somebody from, from Barbados, St. Lucia, Jamaica, the whole island that lives anywhere in the vicinity is gonna turn up and turn out, right? Because we come from a people, for the most part, who in Africa were warriors, right? A lot of us are descended from the warrior people. And so what we know is that there has to be a loud voice and a volume. What I'm saying here though is the numbers of Asian Americans who even though the levels of vaccinations has risen are remaining in their homes out of fear. They're not re-engaging and coming out for fear that they're going to be targeted and attacked. That's not necessarily, and I want to be really careful that I'm not overgeneralizing, but that's not necessarily how Black people are functioning, right? Because what we're not seeing is um, the, 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 the fear that immobilizes me is that my 14-year-old grandson in two years will have a learner's permit and a cop is gonna pull him over. That's the kind of, but right now for a lot of Asian Americans who have not experienced the volume of verbal, physical attacks, they're scared to go back out into the world and scared to send the children back out into the world. So, so that's one thing. The other part of this that I, that I really, living here in, in Los Angeles, for the past 22 years has taught me a lot. And Proposition 209, because you know in, in California, everything is done by proposition. Proposition 209, which was passed in 1966 by state statute um, made it so that affirmative action, race, gender, religion could not be called into certain statewide functions. 
But these did not, Proposition 209 did not supersede federal law, right? I may have these statistics a little off, but not by much. Before Prop 209, Asian American businesses in the state of California um, with state contracts got somewhere on the order of plus 20% of state contracts. Today, it's less than 3%. This is a function of Prop 209. And yet, when I talk to my African-American leaders here, like Michael Lawson, who heads the, the LA Urban League, and I said to them within the past six months, do you know the leaders of the anti-affirmative action movement in the state of California are? And they, uh, Republicans, white Republicans? No, it's Chinese and Chinese Americans. And for the black people, it was like, what are you talking about? And I said, understand, the same people who are being backed as the anti-critical race theory for all of you in New York who are dealing with all of the outrage around um, the specialty high schools, Bronx Science, Stuyvesant, all the above, and, and the largely Asian American, mostly Chinese American parents are insisting that their children by virtue of the tests should have the right, if it's gonna be 100% Asian then it's gonna be 100% Asian. And then you have the pushback. When I was a kid in New York, probably a third of the school was black, probably a third of the school was Latino and, then, and, and white and a handful of Asians. It's very different today. The same movement is funding in the state of California the anti-affirmative action stance. So that what we're seeing here is the belief among some quarters of this state, not all, again, not all, but that African-Americans and Latinx people are inferior intellectually and therefore don't have the right to take up the seats at UCLA, at Stanford, fill in the blank. And this is the stuff that, I'm, that I believe that as journalists who, by the way, the reporters are not the ones who are gonna control what their stories are. So we need to be really clear about that. It is actually the assigning managers, the editors, the producers, the assignment editors who are determining what is news. And if the reporter speaks up loudly enough and fights hard enough, maybe you will get to tell the story you want to tell, but that's not usually how it works, right? So to be clear, a gathering like this is, is immensely helpful, no question, but it'd be really interesting to find out how many of the news decision makers are attending because that's who really should be hearing this. You know what we're gonna do, Paula? That's a, that's a great idea. So we're gonna send them all a recording Yes. I think, you know, we got to spread this as far and wide as we can to make sure they all hear it. Uh, I got to tell the audience that there are so many questions in the chat, in the Q&A, uh, and our panelists also have questions. And, and, and John, I want you to weigh in on the role that foreign press plays in, uh, in, in racism. Right. One of the things that, picking up on what Paula and Cheryl Lynn were talking about, recognizing again that Asian Americans, about two thirds of our population are immigrants uh, born from a different country. We have to recognize the role that foreign, frankly, state run media has in instilling racism, instilling classism into these immigrants before they even get to the United States. I had the privilege of living in China uh, for about six years from 2008 to 2014. And I can tell you for a fact that the way that the Chinese state-run media on mainline China portrays the United States as a whole, but then the African-American, Latino com American community will feed into this racism that these immigrants, these Chinese immigrants will have when, before they even get to the United States. So part of our issue, and this is the role of all of you, as well as the role of organizations like mine, is that we have to unteach some of that and make sure that people understand what America really represents. Because frankly, for the Chinese media, and I am gonna be very direct about this, they have an agenda as to why they wanna portray the United States as still of a, a, a sort of a wild west, 
you know, gang infested culture that they are trying to suggest that their system, their government system protects people better than our government system here. So in this sense, it's also about democracy. And so these are some of the untold stories that we also need to unpack, because if we're trying to understand racism, that's another piece. The other last piece I would but, say- But John, how are we supposed to have an impact on the, on the foreign press like that? You said we, should, we have to teach them. How are we supposed to teach them? What can we do? Oh, no. So it's not so much teaching the foreign press. I mean, you're right. There's not much. But like for us, right, recognizing that our readers, especially in this case, Chinese immigrants, this is the mindset that they have. We need to go back a little bit to basics in some ways, about what American history is, how we show up for each other, sort of the fact that sort of this diversity has been a strength of ours to help unteach these immigrants about what, you know, that I, I'm going to be very direct that, you know, not all African-Americans and Latino Americans are gangsters or drug lords or whatever, because that's the image that they have, right? That's the image that some of these Chinese or Asian immigrants have about us. And this does go beyond journalism, right? This does go to the entertainment industry. It goes much further to, in, in terms of how we're presenting ourselves. But I want to make sure we have that understanding because part of this is unlearning that, that we need to help people do. And John, I think to add to that, there's definitely a role for organizations like AJA where we can work with ethnic media, Chinese language, Korean language, and other language uh, media outlets to help bring these conversations to them, knowing that many of our parents and grandparents, that's the only source of news for them. A lot of people, the ethnic radio stations, the, the media outlets, the, the newspapers we pick up outside the restaurants and at H Mart, that's the only way that they get their news. So we need to recognize that as AJ, we have a role to play there too in, in helping educate those, um, those outlets and, and working with them. Um, Sheldon, I know you have a hard stop in a few minutes. Uh, I do want to toss you a question from the chat here. Um, we have a question from Frances Wang um, about, well, she says, I've been disgusted by the media coverage that has demonized and further criminalized Black men. In addition, the failure of mental health services and the prison system is rarely discussed in a substantive way in, a violence, in the violence that's occurred. Sherilyn, can you please give your thoughts on any resources on this? Also, frankly, I felt that white and Asian journalists uncritically fell into this and this creates resentment that has isolated me. What's your response to that? Thanks. I mean, one of the one of the most encouraging and heartening things in this period has been um, the really powerful discipline and commitment of Asian American activists in their refusal to do what everyone I think expected out of the gate when these attacks, when we saw the rise in anti-Asian hate crime begin to happen last year, at the same time that this powerful movement uh, around re-examining public safety and re-examining the imprint of law enforcement in Black communities was happening. And there was an explicit, this is not like you had to dig for it, you know, there were, there were actually statements made by uh, activists and organizations, including uh, John's, but many others as well, in, including very grassroots organizations, in their refusal to um, request you know, additional police presence in their communities. They were very explicit that their response was not to ramp up law enforcement. And it was to address the precise issues that you're raising, Michelle, which have been part of the portfolio of issues that have been part of uh, the movement for Black Lives and the movement for Black Lives Matter and all of the activism around addressing uh, police violence against unarmed African-Americans. A key part of it has been about mental health services, about services for the homeless, about youth services, and about the, the fact that those matters are actually not best handled by law enforcement, that it's actually our disinvestment from the kinds of community supports that are targeted at those communities that uh, actually exacerbates the problem. And that instead we shunt those problems into our criminal justice system and have armed constabulary respond to young people hanging out on the street who don't have jobs or homeless people or people who are mentally ill, when in fact we could be making different kinds of investments. So there was a very explicit decision made by a, a coalition of Asian American groups and organizations that they would not call for increased law enforcement presence in their communities in a response 
to uh, these attacks. Uh, and that, you know, the bystander training was a big part of that too, but basically saying, no, actually this is an opportunity for us to talk to citizens and, and people in the communities about their responsibilities when they see something happen, what they're supposed to do and giving them the tools to be able to know how to respond in particular moments. It was incredible, incredibly powerful. I haven't seen a, a deep dive on that story, but to me, among all of the uh, Alliance stories, that one is the most powerful and the most hopeful because it's it's the default you know, to say, we're seeing incidents, we wanna have more police, but it was understood that we were precisely at a moment when that question about police presence in our communities was being interrogated and that this was likely to be used by law enforcement to actually ramp up uh, law enforcement to increase funding, to have greater police presence in black communities and to increase arrests. This was very courageous, very courageous and very important. Um, and I'm sure John has, uh, you know, resources in terms of the community groups that were engaged in this effort, but it was uh, super powerful and it's worth some attention. Yeah, we'll drop that link in the chat. And sorry about that earlier. That was a question from Terrence Fraser, uh, being uplifted by Francis. I was multitasking and misreading. No problem. Listen, I do have to go. I thank you all so much for involving yeah. me in this terrific conversation. I'm so glad thank you're doing you. this and keep doing what you're doing. Paula, always great to see you, John, my dear friend. Michelle, it's been great to get to know you. And Dorothy, yeah, keep on keeping on. This is great work. And um, I'm here as a resource um, to continue elements of this conversation if you wish to do so. Take care. All right. Absolutely, Thanks. we will definitely Bye. do this again. Um, Michelle, we want to move on to an, another question from the chat room, okay? And this one is uh, actually for, for Paula from J. Dean. Uh, he says a lot, but then his question is, I wanted to learn more about what you think on, on the topic of anti-Blackness and the concept of dark skin within the Asian Asian American community and older generations in this new age of Black Lives Matter in Stop Asian American Hate? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I was alluding, that's what I was alluding to earlier, that um, the, the, the darker skin aspect, really, wherever you go in the world, is more associated with people who toil in the fields, right? So the people of the so-called lower economic classes are the ones who are perceived to, to have the darker skin. So when you start, therefore, um, you know, ranking people, which goes on in so many societies, but the ranking of people, it, it really does mean that, as I said earlier, the the, the history of China is that anyone not Chinese is less than, that, that's just what they, you know, that's, that's what they see. Their world starts in China. So when then they confront from, a, from, from that perspective dealing with the West and with the West, putting dark skin at the bottom of the um, ladder. Therefore, it just, you know, one in one equals two. Therefore, people with dark skin, black people are less than. So it isn't, as I said, it isn't even that they had an association and involvement with people of the African diaspora. It's from television. Go to China, any one of the hundreds of channels that are on, are showing westerns comedies. I sat with my uncle. He sp he's you know spoke Hakka and Cantonese. I speak English. We didn't understand each other. I'm sitting there watching television with him. He's laughing. I'm laughing because he's laughing. But I'm sitting there going, why am I watching this crap? But my uncle was 88. I I had out of respect, right? I had I had to sit there and I and I was not going to challenge what he was watching, especially because he couldn't understand me, right? But what, what, I, what I'm saying here is that these are things that, on the other hand, my old self was out on the dance floor in the club in Shenzhen, and my husband and I were dancing, and I, you know, doing my little step, and I had my eyes closed. And when I opened my eyes, there were people in the line next to me 
mimicking my steps. Because what? Because pop culture everywhere in the world, Black people, people of, of the African diaspora are seen as the creators of that. So there, it's, it's very heavily influenced by the West, okay? And I have just one anecdote that I'm going to share, which then again will speak to the matter of culture and race. When I've been on my book tour and shown my film, especially among Chinese elders in this country, right? Or in Canada or in the Caribbean, them finding out about the wealth my family has accumulated, et cetera, from the documentary, they, they will come to me afterwards and say, oh, you're, you're, you're so successful, we're so proud of you. And I thank them. And then the, the next statement is, um, uh, that's the Chinese. And then I say, well, my father was not Chinese and my mother was only half Chinese. So does it mean that if I had not been successful, that would have been the African in me? And it's like, oh. And I said, I understand that you think you're complimenting me, but that's actually a racist statement, right? Now I understand when speaking to elders, you have to measure your words. You can't be disrespectful, but it is what's called a teachable moment. They think I am so happy to be welcomed into the Chinese community, to have my Chineseness acknowledged, but I really don't give a shit. I'm Chinese, whether you acknowledge it or not. I'm African, whether you acknowledge it or not. I'm Jamaican, whether you, I'm a Harlem girl, whether you acknowledge it or not. These are all facts. I don't need anybody to say, you know what? I can see that and I welcome you. No, that, that, that is not my mentality at all. My mentality is I am in your midst. I am willing to partner with you. My dark skin, my, 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 my Jamaican culture, growing up, some, eating with chopsticks, but in secret, because in Harlem, you can't go outside of your apartment and look like this and eat with chopsticks without drawing a crowd. Like, well, like what, what is that? Better to just have people leave me alone and not even raise it. But what I'm saying, these are cultural distinctions. These are generational, they're racial. There are a bunch of things, but a lot of it can be resolved with conversation and understanding but that's what's largely missing. Right. Thanks, Paula. We got about 10 more minutes. Michelle, you got a question? I wanna make sure we get one of yeah. the- Yeah, um, I see a question here um, from John Funabiki. And uh, John, I'm wondering if you can take this one on. Um, he asks, you know, we've talked about the need to improve news coverage and to provide more context in history. But in addition, in addition to those news stories, what other things could Black and API journalists do to promote greater cross-racial understanding and solidarity in support of racial justice and equity? So I guess going a step beyond um, news coverage and a more mindset toward um, promoting solidarity. That, that's an interesting question. I, I, I oftentimes think about the smaller gestures uh, one of the things as I've been talking about these issues, and I'm not sure how it necessarily manifests itself specifically here for journalists, but it's thinking about where we could show up for each other. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, like I said, one of the issues that Asian Americans always face is sort of this perpetual foreigner syndrome, right? This notion that we're a foreigner. Uh, the typical question is the where are you really from question that we always get, right? Uh, for the African American community, on the other uh, other hand, oftentimes it's it's uh, I find you know oftentimes they, they will get questions, especially in this moment, about well, why you insist on saying Black Lives Matter? Doesn't all lives matter, right? So for me, it's if I am with an African American friend and that question is asked after, for me to take it upon myself to say, here's why Black Lives Matter means something. Here's why we need that phrase, right? It shouldn't be the burden that that the burden falls on. African-American colleague or friend 
to explain themselves, explain their identity. Likewise, on the flip side, what I would ask of my friends is that if I am ever asked the question, where are you really from? You know, they would say, he's from Chicago. You know, that's a Midwestern accent that you hear. So, you know, it, you sort of being able to show up for each other in that sort of way. So I, I'm not sure exactly how it manifests itself specifically with respect to sort of stories that you're covering. I mean, part of it might be thinking about sort of opportunities where you have an Asian American journalist that covers a quote unquote African American story, you know, sticking up for each other, obviously in the newsroom. I mean, that's a, that's an easy example, right? Is it shouldn't fall upon the African American journalist to always be pitching the African American story, right? Because it, it sounds different, it resonates differently if you have another community of color, just another ally that speaks up about it. Thank you, John. Um, you know, let's look at a couple of questions that are directly. Uh, how we as journalists can do better. And, and Paula, uh, you, you touched upon this and the limitations that we have. So here's one, uh, the advice. What advice do you give to young journalists of color as they start their careers? Sure. Um, I think that the, 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 uh, it has to be about courage. Um, I think I think a person's stamina is challenged virtually every day in a newsroom. Um, meaning that you have to be willing to fight for and stand up for your stories and what you want to pitch. When I was news director in New York, um, I made it a point out of every five days to give each reporter at least one research day, right? And I did that with the intention that they would go out and find what I consider to be, um, well, what the world would consider to be enterprise stories. My, my, my statement was if there's 15 million people in metropolitan New York, that means that there's at least 15 million stories. So why in every half hour do we tell about the same seven or eight stories? And they'd look at me. Well, because we have to cover this and we have to cover that. And, and I said, I got, a, I got five or six newscasts throughout the day. I can put some stories on some newscasts and other stories on others. So if you come to me with a story that I think is worth 10 minutes, it will get 10 minutes. They didn't believe me. And we absolutely would do that. Uh, and in, in about a year, every newscast we had on the air on NBC4 was number one. Because what I, what I wanted people to do was go out and learn the community. Don't tear stories out of newspapers. That was back in the day. Tear stories out of newspapers and then bring it into the newsroom, the TV newsroom, and turn it into moving pictures. I don't need that. I'm, I, I actually would be willing to do an anchor read on something that had been front page of the newspaper. If what we came up with was a story that other people weren't even aware of. And when you approach journalism uh, that way, collectively, right? It doesn't mean that I, because I am black, I'm going to do the black stories. It might mean that if I cover this particular region or this particular topic, I'm going to do all the stories about that and it won't have necessarily any racial boundaries. Boundaries, But if there's a story that I can bring a particularly insightful perspective to because I'm Black, then absolutely I should do that story. So the allyship is one, but my early days as a reporter and having the big dogs in the newsroom, the big guys who covered city hall and government standing right next to my desk and laughing about a Chinese fire drill. I'd never heard that phrase, but it was clearly something that because of the frat boy laughing made me know it was unsavory. So I stood up and walked over to them and I asked, two months into the job. 
excuse me, what's a Chinese fire drill? Oh, you know what a Chinese fire drill is, they said. And I said, no, I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you're, you know, in high school or college and you're in a car and the, at the stoplight and, and the red light and everybody gets out of the car at the same time and they run around the car and then get back in. And I said, so why is that a Chinese fire drill? Oh, you know, it's Chinese, like all confusing, like ching chong, ching chong. And I physically recoiled. I said, what? You've heard of that before. I said, number one, I grew up in New York. So we didn't have cars in high school. We took the subway. Two, if I weren't standing here, a joke like that, a racist statement like that would be made about Black people. I said, but I am standing here. And you said it about Chinese people. Say it again, and I'm going to kick your ass. They were like, what? I said, oh, you may beat me, but I guarantee you, I will turn this place out. I'll get other people to come in here. Now, that gave me a reputation. Very non-Chinese, very much Caribbean and Harlem girl, okay? So what I'm saying here is that I did get a reputation, but I also became an editor at that paper because my excellence in my work is what was speaking for me. And when they complained about me and I said how uncomfortable I was having these racists standing right next to me with wild abandon saying this and no one checking them was like, oh, you're right. We didn't think about that. I am saying that this is where the allyship, this is where the camaraderie, this is where standing up for right, for what's right for each other and for everyone becomes the order of the day. So the chat is going crazy. I think there's a Paula fan club formulating in the chat. Uh, everyone yeah. That your reporters were very lucky to have you as a news executive. And I think- Tiwa Chang was one of my reporters. Ask he, was, he was on. He said, uh, hello, cousin Paula. He said that early <laughs> on. <laughs> and we have a lot of messages that are only being sent to panelists. And it just said, Paula, you are the bomb. Um, well, I know, John, you have a hard stop. So before you go, I would love to um, toss over to you to see if, if you have any final thoughts, any wrap up thoughts, um, anything you want to impart to us before you go. I, I appreciate that. I think the last thing I would say, and this is, it's always obvious, but it does bear repeating. It's just, you know, this is a long term process, right? And, and it's great to have this panel, but to, to me, this is the start of a conversation. Like Cheryl, and certainly I welcome working with all of you, sort of talking through some of these issues, how they come up, how they manifest themselves. Because one of the themes that you're hearing tonight is there is a lot that has to get unpacked. You know, certainly the Asian American community is not a monolith. The African American community is not a monolith. And we need to really understand how to unpack, that, understand where those pitfalls are, what those myths are, so that sort of we don't fall trap for that. Because certainly for the Asian American community, we've seen that happen in the past. And we need to continually educate ourselves during this process to make sure we, we don't fall into those traps. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for your insight, uh, for your educating us like you have. You're absolutely fabulous. Uh, it, is, it is clear too from the chats and the questions uh, that you get lots of applause here. And Michelle, we gotta do this again. We gotta have everybody back. Yeah, we have too many questions. We have to do it again. Yeah. Thanks, Paula, John. we're not going to let you go yet. We just we got we have just a couple of more questions. Okay. And 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 and, and then we'll let you go. All right. Because okay. you said something when we were having the prep, uh, and and it goes to one of the questions that we also have from our journalist. You talked about the impact of mental health on the violence that we're seeing, and I I think it's important that you you share that thought. Sure. Sure. Well, um, I was speaking at it from the perspective of when I am seeing the video of attacks on uh, Asian Americans that um, I, I was in the newsrooms in the era where good picture could supersede anything. We got good picture. Uh, to be two things, great sound, good picture. And um, for me, that wasn't enough. But what I, what I am watching is as these stories about the attacks are um, shared 
in the news media. Um, I'll, I'll use the example of the woman who was walking on mid, in Midtown Manhattan. It was a there was a, a black woman who appeared to be to me to be partially clothed, and she was swinging a hammer, and she ultimately um, hit. I think there were two or three Asian women walking down the sidewalk, and she hit one of them in the head, injuring her badly. Right, and I looked at that and I said. I know this is gonna be played over and over and over again. And it's not that it should not have been. It was good picture in the definition of, ooh, somebody who was in the kitchen hearing that story, the lead in, they come out and look. Good picture, I gotta see that. However, I would have imagined that me walking it down the street in New York as a native New Yorker, if I saw that woman coming towards me, I probably would have stepped out into the street and crossed over to the other side of the street. This is not a blame the victim issue, not at all. What I'm saying is that you can spot when someone is not well from a little bit of a distance. So as these women continue to walk, maybe they weren't paying attention. This woman, the, 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 the black woman hit the Asian woman attacked her with this hammer. What I said is that that woman appeared to me to be mentally ill. The video that I saw, she appeared to be mentally ill. And what I'm saying is that what we know for a fact is that black people are overrepresented among the mentally ill and among homeless, certainly in New York. And so when we're reporting these stories and showing this good picture over and over and over again, we are responsible for trying to add some context, some perspective, so that what we're not doing is having people run because they see a black person walking towards them. More than the person being a black person, the person was a violent, mentally ill person, right? And so what I'm saying that is as journalists, those stories have to go deeper than just an anchor VO, a little bit of sound. Let's get something from the police officer who says, yes, and so you got to put more to it than just that. It's not suitable to just grab the picture and show it. And we think we're being responsible by saying um, some of these, um, I, we warn you, so th this may be difficult to watch for some people. That goes about this far in terms of the degree of responsibility we have when we put something like that on the air. So that's really what I wanted to address. There is a story there, but the story is more than a woman, a, a, a black woman attacked an Asian woman. And here's another example of, it is another example of, but what is an example of two? Um, un, the unhospitalized, untreated, un whatever of the unhoused walking the streets of this country. That's what we're seeing with that guy who used to live in the White House having pretty much put a target on the backs of almost any Asian American. So what we have here now it's not a simple story, and therefore you can't give it 45 seconds. It's not a simple story. You've certainly given us um, a lot of good ideas. In fact, all the panelists uh, have given us great ideas for stories that we should all pursue. Michelle, are we gonna wrap? We're gonna ask another question. Um, are you gonna let me tell what my project is? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So that's going to that's going to be our wrap. Um, before you talk about that project with all of you need to stay and, and hear about the project project uh, that that's coming up. Um, but I, we're not going to be able to get to all of your the rest of your your questions. So like I said before, this clearly means that Michelle, we're going to have to do this again. Uh, but Paula, please let sure. us know what For, you're working First, on. let me say that my easy email is Paula Madison at Yahoo one word, Paula Madison. So if you got a burning question that you wanted to direct to me and, and we didn't get to it, feel free to email me. That's one. 
to um, myself, Helen Zia, who some of you know as, a, as an iconic Chinese American journalist, writer, and activist who eventually became the executor of the Vincent and Lily Chin estate. Uh, she actually is my executive producing partner. So Helen Zia, Don Young from the Center for Asian American Media of which I am a board member and Vic Bullock who was the um, founding executive director of the Hollywood branch of the NAACP, that one which negotiated all of the memoranda of understanding for uh, how TV stations and studios operated in Hollywood. The four of us have come together as executive producers and we are producing, executive producing a limited series on um, the circumstances around the bludgeoning murder of Vincent Chin and uh, the pan-Asian American civil rights movement that came about as a result of that in um, June of 1982. You've been hearing a lot of swirl about who's doing what. You might have even read about the um, Hold Still Vincent podcast that lasted three days because of some things that they should have done that they didn't do. Um, tomorrow morning, the announcement or the news release will go out about our contract with a major studio in Hollywood. We're doing that. And my other project is my book, Finding Samuel Lowe, um, which you can find at findingsamuellow.com, uh, is actually in, um, in development with Amazon and Legendary Pictures for a limited miniseries. Um, that's the, my documentary and book about going and finding my Chinese grandfather's family in China. But it will air in China and it will air here in the US. And so why am I doing that? Because I find myself in, this is a unique position. I find myself in the unique position of being at an intersection of African and Asian diasporas and in a position to tell stories where they cross. What a lot of people don't know is Jesse Jackson uh, paused his presidential campaign to go to Detroit to speak out against the murder of Vincent Chin, that a number of African-American civil rights leaders and organizations um, came together with the Asian American community in Detroit to demand the civil rights for um, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, all the above. So we have a long and storied history and I would commend you all to find the film um, that my friend Baldwin Chu, C-H-I-U, shot about um, the Mississippi, uh, the fact that his grandfather and great-grandfather were in Mississippi. Um, he's fifth generation United States and didn't even know it. But they're the Chinese Americans who are among the black people who, who have been serving as grocers and keeping those communities alive. We do have a very long and storied history of connection, but we, it's just not highlighted enough. Well, thank you for telling that important story. And I think it's, it, it will inspire many other storytellers to explore those opportunities. You know, a lot of AJ journalists are kind of looking for those journal journalism adjacent type roles or they're moving into storytelling or creative roles. And I think you will be a great inspiration for them to bring that sort of nuance and in-depth coverage of our intersections of our community. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for all of your work. Um, we have had such a Great time just hearing from you and learning from you and all of our panelists. It's been an amazing discussion in so many ways. We got history lessons. We got uh, a new phrase, uh, rice is nice. We got- <laughs> That's not mine. It's not mine. I, somebody said it. You and learned I love a new it. phrase? I love it so much. I, I love, love it. it so much. <laughs> it's, great. it's great. And we got story ideas and we got a lot of inspiration and context. So thank you all for joining us. And like Dorothy said, we will have to do another one and, and keep this conversation moving because this is what we're here for and we want to continue encouraging this conversation. Yeah, this has uh, been enlightening. Uh, it's been fabulous. I learned a lot. I think uh, all of our, the audience learned a lot and, uh, and more than anything, I hope that the journalists who, who tuned in will remember uh, much of what you heard today and that it will have an impact on how you cover 
our communities, how you cover any community, because clearly it's important. Uh, thank you guys again. And to that, we will say good night. Uh, farewell. Good Have night.